everyone for being here and those following us on the live stream here and kick off the event. That was a fantastic panel. I have to wish I have remarks from some of the different Center Warner and then a presentation from Chris and Eric. Thank you so much for our panel. And Paul, will you kick it off? Uh, happy to, Ravi. Uh, can you guys hear me? Is this being? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Rafi, and thank you to Senator Warren and Senator Fisher for uh, hosting this panel on this very important topic. Uh, I want to get the introductions out of the way quickly because we have 35 minutes uh, and a lot to say. Uh, my name is Paul Ohm. I'm a professor of law and uh, associate dean for academic affairs at the Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, and I work in the fields of information privacy, cybersecurity. Let me uh, insult the people up here and not give them the biographies that they're due and instead just highlight some of the kind of uh, high points of who they are and what they bring to this conversation. Uh, to my far left is Marshall Irwin, the Senior Director of Trust and Security at the Mozilla Corporation. Uh, to my le immediate left is Arunesh Mathur, a PhD student at Princeton um, and the Center for Information Technology Policy. To my right is Katie McInnes, Policy Counsel for Consumer Reports. Uh, and then far at, uh, end at the right is Amina Fazlullah, Policy Counsel at Common Sense Media. Uh, so we're here today to talk about dark patterns, and if you'll indulge me for two minutes, I'll put my professor's hat on and talk a little bit about what we mean when we use that uh, admittedly somewhat ambiguous term, why it matters, uh, and I'll say a few words about the legislation that the senators have proposed. Uh, the term dark patterns dates back to uh, 2000, when a UX, a user experience consultant named uh, Harry Brignall first coined the term. Uh, and he used it really as a kind of cautionary tale to people in his field who were developing online websites and other experiences that he thought were intended to make users kind of operate against themselves. Uh, and so you'll see many definitions kind of swirling around, but they all have kind of three or four different main components. Uh, we're usually talking about an online interface, so you're going to hear us talk about UX and UI, user interface and user experience. Uh, these interfaces are intentionally designed to manipulate users. And here we get into the kind of entire basket of behavioral and cognitive biases that uh, psychologists have been studying for many decades. And what's critical uh, is the effect of a, of a UX or UI that's labeled dark pattern. Uh, it, it induces the user to take an action they would otherwise not take under normal circumstances. Uh, and so if you are inducing a user to do something that they might want or might benefit them, we might call that a beneficial nudge. Uh, but if you're doing something that they would not choose and might act against their interests, usually because it acts at your interest as the designer, uh, that's when we start to call it a dark pattern. But even in that kind of disquisition, I hope you can see there's a, a lot of room for debate about what we mean by that, and even more importantly, what we might do to regulate something like that. Uh, let me just give you one illustration I quipped at the beginning that we maybe should have had a few slides. It's a very visual thing we're talking about. Uh, but we're not talking about anything too exotic. You've run into dark patterns every day you use the web, including probably today. Uh, Henry Br Brignall now has a website uh, where he has categories. For some reason, people who do dark patterns love taxonomies. And so uh, one big thing in his taxonomy is what he calls confer shaming, which is when you have one button that gets the user... Uh, to do the thing you want them to do that they may not want to do, and you label that yes, and then you put something else in the other button. You, one would think you would put the word no, uh, but you don't. So there's a Tumblr that collects con for shaming examples. Let me read some of I had an enjoyable 25 minutes last night going through them. Uh, let me highlight some of my favorite. This is the button that you would expect to see no. Uh, no thanks, comma. They always start like that. I'd rather pay full price. I hate free money. I don't like delicious food. I want to keep dwelling in my mom's basement. But then we up the stakes a little bit with this next group. Uh, I don't eat. I don't like cute babies. Journalists should go hungry. Uh, then you get the weirdly specific. I'll just stick to the latest Adam Sandler films. I don't want to understand my dog. I already have a bikini body, which is the one I usually click. Um, and then there was one website that just literally cut to the chase and put, I am a bad person. Okay, so this is one version of what we're talking about. I'm not here to say that we should regulate these buttons out of existence, but I just wanted to uh, add a little concreteness to this. So to begin, um, timing is everything. If you uh, open up your New York Times today, you probably saw an article about an enterprising young PhD student at Princeton uh, who just released new results in a new paper um, about dark patterns. He happens to be sitting to my left. So Arnish, could you tell us a little bit about the study and about 
um, the results that you got from it. Sure. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the uh, study we conducted at Princeton at CITP. Um, like uh, Paul just mentioned, we had been seeing uh, many online services and websites use dark patterns in our everyday use of the internet. Uh, and we realized, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could systematically investigate the websites that are actually using this at scale and try to understand how these dark patterns actually appear in the first place, what do they look like, uh, and what are the technical means these websites are using to create dark patterns in the first place? Uh, and we decided, well, why don't we study this in the context of online shopping? And that's one of the uh, uh, things people do on the internet that, uh, that reaches everyone. Everyone shops online here. Um, and so we built a little bot uh, that would visit a shopping website and try to gather all the little pieces of information the shopping website actually exposes to users. Uh, and then once we got this information, we ran some initial analysis. And um, what we found really surprised us. Uh, we discovered a variety of different dark patterns in over 1,000 uh, different shopping websites. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples of these patterns. Um, one, uh, which is my personal favorite, was sneak into basket, where you would uh, buy a bouquet on a website, and the website would, uh, without your consent, add a greeting card uh, in the hopes that you'll actually purchase it. Uh, maybe you will notice it, maybe you won't, uh, you're not sure. Um, there's another, we found another instance where a website would tell you, hey, there are 45 other people looking at this product right now. Please make sure you buy it, otherwise you're going to run out of stock. And then when we looked at the underlying code that generated this message, there was really a random number generator generating random values. Uh, and you can see how uh, some of the patterns Paul mentioned and some of the ones that I'm mentioning really represent a spectrum of possible harms these can cause to users. Uh, and so um, I would just like to conclude by saying we created a website, uh, and I highly recommend you look at it. You can ask for the URL. I'd be happy to share it with you after this, uh, which showcases many of the different patterns we found. And uh, there's also a data set that you can explore and play around with. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So Katie, I'm sure one question that um, occurs to everyone when they first encounter dark patterns is, um, are these merely annoying inconveniences of modern life, or is there something more harmful and more important happening here. So how are consumers kind of impacted by dark patterns? Does it impact the work of your organization? It's a great question. So consumers are impacted by these dark patterns not only because they're nudged away from decisions that may enable them to protect their data more effectively. For instance, the Norwegian Consumer Council submitted this huge report last summer documenting how companies like Facebook and Google make it hard for users to actually execute the rights and the controls that they have under the GDPR. We don't have those rights here in the US to some extent, but we do also still have these same deceptive patterns that will nudge someone away from protecting their information from Facebook, from say no to some sort of ads, or from sharing additional information like contacts in their phone list. Um, so these not only undermine the choices that are available to you on these platforms, but they can also cost you money. For instance, ticketing websites use a countdown clicker that will make you feel encouraged to purchase a ticket, even though at the end you all of a sudden see these uns like surprise fees. They increase the amount of the ticket by 10, 20 bucks. And by that point, you've already entered your payment information, there's a countdown clicker, you have the sense of false scarcity that may or may not be true, and so you push yes and you accept, even though that ticket is now much more than you would have expected. We also have seen that companies will add another layer to this darkness, right? One aspect of the dark is the fact that it's pushing you away from a decision that benefits you. Another one is that it's obscured from the user. So we saw Intuit, which is the parent company of H&R Block and TurboTax, use these same dark patterns to undermine your statutory right to file taxes for free if you're under a certain income bracket. This was not only obscured from the user, but also there was false advertising along the way that made the user think that they were leading to a free product. And instead, despite the fact that they have this statutory um, promise to be able to file for free, they would be charged somewhere between $60 to $120. And this was done intentionally by the company with code that was on the back end, and so thus obscured from the user. And also, along the way, they were told that it would be free. This directly impacts users in their day-to-day -day lives, not only protecting their data, but also protecting the data of others, for instance, sharing your contact list, and it impacts your wallet as well. And we see that they're in all sorts of products. Uh, for instance, we at Consumer Reports rate products for privacy and security. We looked at some smart TVs last year at the beginning of 2018, and one thing that we found was that many of the controls that you're able to use on your TV to maybe limit how much the TV manufacturer sees about your day-to-day -day viewing habits, we saw that those were not only hard to find, but in many cases obscured from the user by the use of a grayscale text in the far right-hand corner where you're not looking 
or the sense that um, the privacy controls that we were provided were under another title, like TV optimization controls, uh, which I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a privacy control to me. Um, so it's hard for us to compare these pretty similar products to each other when their user interfaces sometimes design, are designed to push a user away from protecting their privacy. Um, and it's incredibly tough to evaluate these things against each other, especially when uh, companies often say that they made it hard for users to change their settings or to find their settings because along the way they're trying to disclose to the user what they will get if they share more information or leave this control on. Thank you. And Amina, let's continue on this kind of idea of, of harms. Uh, Katie highlighted how some of these might have a disparate impact on certain communities. For example, uh, it, low income communities might suffer more when we're talking about small little kind of things that would be annoyances for some people, but significant monetary impacts for others. Uh, I'm sure every one of us has a story of an older person in our life who uh, repeatedly gets hit by kind of scams that are abetted by dark patterns. Uh, and so there's another kind of insular community that's focused at Common Sense. You think a lot about kids. Can you talk a little bit about dark patterns in children or families uh, and how the impacts are on them? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, a lot of kids, their first experience with the Internet will be through games um, or apps. And um, there was recently a study done by Dr. Jenny Rudesky looking into manipulative apps that were, or apps that were targeted towards children under the age of five. Um, so these are for very young children, and they would use design techniques that would try to shame or confuse children into in-app purchases, um, or to try to keep them on the app for longer. Um, so for example, a child would be playing a game where their ultimate goal would be to, you know, bake a cake for the host character in the game. And if they bake the cake with the available items, the host character would shame them and say, no, I don't like this cake, you eat the cake. Um, trying to push the child into purchasing the, the strawberry that the, the host character would actually want on its cake. So these are um, manipulative techniques that children are definitely unable to discern. Um, sometimes uh, on, the, on the screen, they'll um, have icons or buttons um, that will appear to be part of gameplay. Um, and children will click on them, not realizing that they're either being asked to make a purchase or being shown an ad or being directed onto another site. Um, and then um, also there are games that um, to continue on, it starts as free, but to actually continue the gameplay, it'll ask for payments or microtransactions to continue the game forward. Um, and children may not realize that by clicking to go forward, they're actually making a purchase. Um, we filed a complaint with the FTC um, focusing on practices by Facebook um, where children were making in-app purchases and game purchases um, and racking up thousands of dollars. Um, and when parents were trying to claw back these purchases, um, Facebook made it very difficult for them to figure out how to actually get these refunds or to to rectify these purchases that were made in error. And for families who are vulnerable, families that are new to the internet, um, that are low income, that are non-English speakers, um, trying to navigate this process to get back their information, change a setting, to get a refund is incredibly difficult. It's time consuming and it may be something that may be out of their grasp depending on how sophisticated they are with the use of the internet. Um, so those could be lost dollars and it's lost time. And for families that are new to the internet, um, we know that every day there are more and more critical activities um, that are going online, access to healthcare, access to banking, access to education. Um, if they're scared away uh, by using the internet because they're worried they may unwittingly um, allow for tracking, um, uh, make purchases or give up information or that their children may be harmed, they may be exposed to some kind of predator because they're online and they're accepting information. Um, you know, we definitely want to prevent that from happening because these are new members um, of the online community and um, they may be scared away from utilizing this important resource. Great, uh, thank you. And then Marshall, it's, it's great to have you on the panel because um, up until now, uh, we've been talking about this very much in the abstract. There are these kind of things that are creating these dark patterns and aren't they so uh, terrifying and don't they cause harm? But of course, 
Uh, these are the results of kind of probably in many cases uh, intentional but thoughtful decisions of companies out there. And so you represent a company, Mozilla. Uh, you've talked publicly about dark patterns. You also play a kind of funny role in the ecosystem in that you make software that interacts with students, but your preeminent piece of software is a browser, which is the kind of conduit or vehicle through which people communicate with users. So in either of those two roles as your lead on trust and security, how do you think about dark patterns? How do you think about communicating with users in ways to avoid dark patterns? Yeah. So there are two important ways that we tend to think about dark patterns. The first, and actually the most important way, is in our own products. Um, so Mozilla, we make the Firefox browser. Browsers are incredibly powerful tools. They sit, it's a piece of software that sits on your device and has access to everything you do online, right? And what that means is, potentially, uh, if we or a browser company were to introduce dark patterns into the product, fundamentally can change the way that people interact online in a really negative way. So this is something that we take very seriously, first and foremost, in our own products and how we design them. Um, moreover, in some respect, we face many of the same incentives as the rest of the industry. You know, we want to design our products to optimize for engagement, for one. And the other term you'll hear sometimes in this space is, and also to decrease user friction. We don't want to increase uh, changes to the user flow that just are jarring to our users, that impact, their, that slow down their ability to engage with our products. Um, and those are, again, incentives that I think a lot of the industry faces. Um, and that's why like, we have a set of checks and principles in place that really take very seriously and try to avoid introducing dark patterns into our own product. Uh, the real principle that we have in play, which I think has actually pre-existed the sort of dark patterns terminology, is what we call no surprises. Basic idea being that if a user were to figure out or start to understand exactly what is happening with the browser, it should be consistent with their expectations. They shouldn't be surprised by it. And if we can look at it and say they would be surprised by this, that means we have to make a change, either by stopping the activity entirely or creating additional transparency that helps people understand. Um, so the second way in which we think about dark patterns is actually finding ways that we can protect people who are using the browser from other parties, from the websites they visit, essentially. Um, so the best example I would give of this is actually cross-site tracking, um, which I think is in some respect the most sort of pervasive and pernicious uh, dark pattern across the web today. That is enabled by cookies, and what we can do programmatically as a browser maker is take action to sort of decrease the attack surface in the browser and actively protect people from those patterns online. So what we have done, what Apple has done as well, is introduce anti-tracking technology to actively intervene to protect people from the diversity of parties today that we fundamentally think are probably not trustworthy and that our users need to be protected against. Um, reason I find the research mentioned earlier so compelling is what we need to be able to do is attack this problem programmatically to identify sort of patterns across the web that we can then put in mitigations for. Um, so what we don't do is say, we know this shopping website is bad, we are going to target this shopping website. Um, ideally, what we like to do is say, look, here's a class of activities across the web and a way that technically we can identify that, that activity is occurring and then block it. Um, and so, like I said, that's the second way. And, and, and first and foremost, we think about this in our own products. Secondarily and importantly, we think about protecting people across the web from this activity. And to the extent that we can identify it programmatically, uh, we really work hard to do that. So that's great. And that's a perfect segue because you kind of talked about ways your company and other companies might self-regulate, might provide uh, consumers with the tools they need to look for dark patterns themselves, um, which if that was all powerful and could solve the problem, then... Uh, it would probably be enough for us to come up here and say tut tut and then industry would clean things up. Um, but that's not why we're here. We're invited by uh, Senators uh, Warner and Fisher because they've introduced the Detour Act. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the kind of intricate detail of the act, but let me just give you a broad overview. They introduced this in April. Um, it focuses on the activities of what they call uh, large providers, online large providers. And so these are providers that have over 100 million users visiting uh, in a given month. And there's a lot of terminology and definitional uh, debate we can have about that decision. Um, it really aims, in my opinion, to do three things. It's actually a pretty compact, clearly written piece of legislation. Uh, under this act, you cannot uh, use practices that trick users in, into obtaining information or consenting. So you can't manipulate users to get information from them. Um, you uh, will now experience new controls 
about conducting, quote, psychological experiments on your users. Uh, and you will no longer be able to target children under 13 with the goal of hooking them into your service in some of the ways that Amina was describing. Uh, it importantly and interestingly uh, extends additional kind of abilities, rulemaking and enforcement to the Federal Trade Commission to begin to police dark patterns a little more expressly. Uh, and so since we've kind of somewhat inadvertently divided the panel in lawyers, techies and people who can't make up their mind, uh, let, me, let me turn to the lawyers and ask you about the Detour Act. Uh, and maybe I'll start with uh, Katie. And in particular, the kind of harms that you were laying out in your first answer, how well does the Detour Act kind of respond to those specific harms? Well, what's great about the Detour Act is it does identify that all these things do harm consumers. Um, however, I'm, I'm not sure how enforcement would be carried out since I mentioned a lot of the things that we've identified as dark patterns, especially on social media sites and um, other big search engines, uh, the kinds of things that we identify as dark patterns, such as confirm shaming, telling them that you, we need access to your face biometrics for security reasons, and that's the only reason we swear, and um, telling them that they also should um, add them, add their contacts so that they can more add friends without telling them that that also means and therefore they would know much more about your personal connections, including lawyers and doctors in your lives. Those sort of, um, those sort of pathways that they take you down, yes, do inform the user and that's one reason why they say that they have to be there. Uh, and one reason why it takes 18 clicks to say no to a privacy invasive practice instead of two clicks to say yes or perhaps just one. So I think that it's going to be hard to suss out where the line is between a manipulative dark pattern and a pattern that is designed to give full disclosure to users according to the company that put them into place. Um, however, I do think that it's great that this is getting more discussion. Um, and I, I do think that many of these dark patterns also probably could also be brought under the FTC Act, Section 5 authority, uh, which we agree with, and we sent a letter to the FTC last summer about some dark patterns we saw on uh, the Facebook platform. Um, but I do think that it's identifying a lot of patterns, it's identifying them as uh, manipulative and deceptive, and hopefully this will lead to either uh, a passage of an act like Detour Act or a more comprehensive privacy bill that includes some of these prohibitions. Yeah, and I think it's key to highlight one thing that was implicit in what you said, which is uh, if all we were talking about was deceptive dark patterns, then we don't need a law. The FTC has all the power it needs to go after deceptive dark patterns today, and in fact, it has. Uh, I should say that I worked at the FTC for a year, uh, and I would love to speak on their behalf, but I haven't been there in such a long time that I probably shouldn't and can't. Um, so, so that's a kind of key distinction that this law does, which is I, I think if this law is kind of enacted and uh, used to the fullest of its capability, it would allow for there to be enforcement for the first time um, of activity that may not cross that kind of admittedly fuzzy boundary into deception, and yet, you know, cabined by all the kind of careful language in the legislation, still might give the Federal Trade Commission kind of an avenue. And so Amita, kind of riffing on either that, um, or on the earlier theme of children and the way they get hooked into video games, et cetera. Uh, what do you think about the Detour Act as kind of a tool in the toolkit of the FTC? Um, I think it's a very helpful tool. I think it's always great for the FTC to have flagged, um, even if they've got Section 5 authority, presumably for some of the items that Detour would cover, um, flagging this, um, codifying it, it, and raising it to the FTC as here's, here's a a bucket of bad activity that you should be going after, I think is a helpful nudge. Um, but also it gives them sort of the confidence that they've got, you know, the they're in the right position to use their to use their enforcement authority to go after this. Um, I also think that um, you know this is a bill that's focusing not just on kids, but on um, consumers, adults and kids alike. And I think it's always helpful when we have um, a law that's going to focus on everybody because it helps raise um, the bar across the board um, instead of relying on enforcement to track down just the violators um, when it comes to kids. Um, that's a tricky endeavor. It takes a lot of enforcement capacity to do that. Um, and then you've got to do a lot of parsing to understand whether or not this is directed at children, whether or not it's actually for adults. Um, so having a law that's focused on everybody, I think, is actually very helpful for children because it means sort of everybody benefits from uh, from the law itself. That's great. And again, I, I, in fact, I make it a policy never to like 
study in a kind of Talmudic fashion a really early bill because who knows if this will ever be law, but since I was invited to the panel, I decided to roll up my sleeves and spend some time with this. Uh, and there's a really kind of interesting distinction again in this very early draft, which is uh, when we talk about the manipulation uh, and the deceptiveness and the things that we've spent most of our time on, uh, then it's clear that FTC now has new power, at least for large providers, uh, to bring action. But there's this kind of separate parallel path that I want to explore with the, uh, the trained technologists on the panel, uh, which is this is really also kind of a broadside against psychological experiments. Um, and so there is a separate set of provisions that say, listen, if you're a large provider and you're in the business, and I want to just quote the language, of subdividing or segmenting your consumers for the purpose of experiments or studies, not a direct quote, I left out some words. Um, first of all, you need the informed consent of every user. And then intriguingly, you also need kind of every 90 days to tell the users that they've become unwitting guinea pigs and also to tell the public the kinds of studies that you're undertaking. And of course, we can think of the emotional contagion study at Facebook and lots of other kind of uh, headlines and controversies over the last few years that this seems designed to address. Uh, and so the question for you, Marshall, and then I want to hear Arnesh uh, opine on this as well. Is this a broadside attack on kind of just malicious psychological testing? Is this all A-B testing? Should we just ban A-B testing? I'm for it. But what would that do to kind of innovation in the tech industry, you know, and, and specifically the D2RX kind of take on all of those questions? Yeah, so I think of uh, dark patterns as ones that we endeavor never to introduce into our product. Um, in comparison, like A-B testing is actually something that we do both on our web properties and in, in the Firefox browser, and it's incredibly useful for us, and there's certain sort of prescriptions we put in place to ensure that it's done properly. Um, but one example I can give you, uh, we've recently released a number of privacy features. A-B testing is remarkably important for privacy features because what privacy features do is they like remove functionality in order to protect people. When you remove functionality, you potentially break the user's experience, so it's important for us to know how it's breaking and whether users respond to it properly. And what we do as a result is we run A-B tests. The A population might get the standard Firefox browser, and the B population will get the browser uh, with an additional privacy feature. And then we kind of measure whether users continue to use those products and whether they have a positive experience with them. Um, so that's just an example of an activity that we think it's critical for actually launching privacy features, but I think it's also something that is benign and, and positive. Um, the challenge in the space is that uh, I think A-B testing tools, which are remarkably sophisticated today, coupled with, again, what I mentioned earlier, this sort of drive to optimize for engagement and decreased friction, they do ultimately, I think, enable a lot of the, the less benign practices across the web. So Paul mentioned these examples earlier of sort of different buttons uh, that you can find. I'm sure all of those were A-B tested for which ones optimized for the click rate without a doubt. Like, and so drawing that line, I think, is really tricky. I would think that the type of a, some, a fair amount of A-B testing should fall outside of this, as like I said, benign and actually important and valuable to users. Uh, but drawing that line is certainly tricky. Uh, and Arnish, I mean, either in the context of the study that you've just released or you know, your the lived experience as a techie, if you want to say more about A-B testing, uh, I, think the, I think the statute, the bill, purports to say that there's this kind of one category we would call behavioral or psychological experiments. And Marshall touched on that. I mean, is, is that the line that you as a trained techie are told, let's not cross that line? It's okay to do some lightweight A-B testing, but let's not make kind of unwitting psych subjects of all of our users? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, we, we, come to, we have realized that dark patterns are often a result of A-B testing, right? Um, where a designer at a company decides, hey, why don't I try this other thing? Uh, maybe this will lead to better engagement or uh, maybe uh, nudge users in a way where the company benefits. But really, A-B testing isn't the problem here, right? It's the intention of how A-B testing is being used. Uh, and I think uh, there are some steps companies and other organizations can take um, to, to sort of have some oversight on the different experiments they, uh, they conduct, where uh, the line is perhaps, uh, does the A-B testing actually uh, lead to some kind of concrete harm, or is the intervention that's being tested uh, inherently problematic? And I think uh, having some sort of independent organization or review uh, can be very useful here. Um, and I think specifically with respect to the act itself, uh, having disclosure of the different uh, uh, A-B tests a company or an organization is running is very valuable. 
Uh, I think that that kind of information could be very useful, not just to uh, users uh, when, to for for them to know what A/B tests they've been a part of, but more generally uh, to to the uh, to the public to realize well what are the intentions or the practices a company has been doing behind the scenes. And I think that could be very very valuable for accountability. Um, just to follow up on that really quickly, um, so so let's just imagine the kind of formative stages of a baby computer programmer who's learning kind of that there's this world of ethics out there and as we design kind of world changing technology, we need to keep ethics in mind. Um, how does the conversation of ethics go to, and this could be for either of you, uh, the sorts of psychological tricks that we're talking about? Is, it, do you, is there ever a moment in your education where, they are, where you were told, what, don't be creepy, these are human beings, and would it be helpful maybe to have a law, and it's not just a prohibition, by the way, this imagines a standard setting body that kind of gets together and debates what do we mean by impermissible psychological testing. What is the current state of this corner of digital ethics education? <laughs> uh, well, the way that we, we think about this internally is like, you know, we do think it's an ethical question, but it's, it's hard when you're building a product to like have ethical checks, right? What we in instead do is like, what is the transparency mechanism uh, that's in place? So when we launch a study, uh, users can always in their browser find out what studies they're enrolled in, right? And that is sort of an, an ethical check that we built technically into the browser. Um, we do have internal processes. I review all of our sort of user flows to sort of make sure they're consistent with the principles that Mozilla um, uh, believes in. But I think those are secondary to those immediate user experiences, like I said, the, the transparency we create in the browser. The other one that I would point to is this requirement in the bill that all studies be disclosed. I think that is not actually something we do today, but it's something that I like a lot, uh, and I think we're going to explore in our own product, because uh, I think there's a lot of value there. Um, and that, I think, starts, that kind of backs into the ethical question by putting requirements in place that really can help solve for this proactively. Yeah. Uh, I can definitely talk uh, through my experience as a student. I think uh, <coughs> academic curriculum is, is very behind when it comes to uh, teaching students about ethics and the kind of uh, more practical, like Paul mentioned, uh, scenarios that show up perhaps when you go to industry. And organizations like Mozilla have really stepped up here where they've been uh, uh, providing funding to centers such as CITP and other, uh, other universities to really come up with a uh, curriculum that can really engage with students at a level where they reason uh, about different dilemmas that they might possibly encounter in their lives as professionals. So I think we have about uh, time for a 30 second reaction to this last kind of provocative thought I want to leave with you. Uh, I noticed that no one on the panel said, uh, you know, nary a negative word about the bill. I think that means there's no opposition to the bill and it'll just slide through. That has to be the only explanation. Um, but let's channel a question we might get from someone who's a little more skeptical of this bill, which is consumers are smarter than you think they are. Uh, and sure, the kind of humorous bu buttons I've been talking about are annoying, but they're in your face. They're not hidden. Uh, and so can you, hopefully in less than 30 seconds each, respond to that? Are consumers smart enough to kind of stand the buffets of these wins by themselves, or do we need legislation? Maybe not exactly this one, but something like this one uh, to support them. And why don't we just go down the table, so Marshall? Yeah, I think consum consumers are smart enough, but they don't have time, and this is incredibly sophisticated stuff that you really have to dig into. Often it's hard for me to understand it, and expecting a user in the middle of their sort of busy day to make these decisions is incredibly challenging. I agree with uh, what Marshall said. I think um, most consumers, if you ask them, uh, when they're not actually doing anything busy or important, they will maybe tell you, oh yeah, I do realize what's going on here. But uh, I think when they're busy doing their work or um, really do, do not, not thinking about uh, techniques like dark patterns, they uh, are probably not aware and uh, there is an increasing chance that they might be misled. Consumers already have so much put on them. Why do we have to put this on this, them as well? They're being persuaded away from making decisions that are in their interest. They're being taken advantage of when they have to make a decision. For instance, they know, right, Sharon, I might know when your battery is low and really need to get home tonight. Uh, and so we shouldn't have to put more on them. And some of these practices should just be uh, taken away from the marketplace entirely. Um, are unable, it's well established that for children whose brains are de developing, they're unable to discern these types of deceptive techniques. Um, so especially for kids, um, these types of practices should be banned. And for vulnerable families who are juggling all sorts of concerns around um, 
income and access to jobs and transportation and health care, um, to put this on their plate as well is just unreasonable. So um, I want to thank the senators for having us. And we're going to get out of uh, their way so they can talk to you about dark patterns as well. I want to thank all of you. The kind of full room and the number of people watching online is a testament to how this is the year of dark patterns. And I'm so glad that we we're able to talk about it with you. And then I would ask you to join me in thanking the panelists for the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am um, Senator Mark Warner, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Senator Deb Fisher. I um, want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to do something unusual. Since we've got a lot of folks actually watching online, I'm going to try to stick to the script, which is very hard for me to do. I uh, want to thank Paul and all of the folks from the last panel. I want to thank Kristen Harris, who just wandered in um, for, for his cooperation, collaboration. And um, for at least the folks who've kind of been in this space for some time, I don't normally give this big a shout out, uh, but kind of the brains behind our operation, Rafi Martina in the back of the room for uh, all, his, um, all his great work. Um, we're here to talk about, and, and I thought your last question, Paul, was a great setup. Um, can you give a reason why not to do this? And uh, the panel, I think... Uh, probably made the case as, w as well as I could, uh, that um, this is a time, this is a year, uh, when we rec need to recognize uh, dark patterns. We need to recognize their ongoing manipulation of the American consumers. And it's time for us to say enough. Uh, in a few minutes, you'll hear from Senator Deb Fisher, um, my partner on the Detour Act. I am grateful for the partnership uh, that we've worked on this bill and the fact that this is the first of this kind of legislation. And the truth is, that protecting users' personal data and user autonomy online are truly bipartisan issues. This is not a liberal versus conservative. It's much more a future versus past. And I think what Senator Fisher and I are leaning into is uh, how we get this future right in a way that takes advantage of the wonderful tools that have been brought about by social media, but also puts some of the appropriate constraints um, in place. Um, I'm optimistic that bills like the Detour Act can ultimately be incorporated into federal privacy legislation. Um, and an important way to make sure that that happens are these kind of education events. And I particularly appreciate, uh, I see a lot of friends in the room, uh, folks who've uh, turned out today and for those who are listening online. Um, some of you may know my background for 20 years, I think I can still claim for about another year or so, that I was a tech guy longer than I've been a politician. And those two things, um, boundaries are coming up. But um, even though I had a background as a tech guy and thought that I had some basic understanding of the challenges around social media, in a whole lot of ways, um, my eyes were dramatically opened uh, through my work as the vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And particularly uh, as we looked at um, the Russian manipulation in 2016, um, it became clear to me that social media companies themselves bore some responsibility for how their platforms were used in, and misused in 2016. In many ways, I think both US government writ large, the Intel community specifically, and the social media companies, we were all caught off guard. And we've been playing catch up since that time. Uh, but one of the things that the Russian manipulation showed, and folks like Tristan had been you know, uh, alert to this before, um, was that while we've all celebrated the benefits that communities have brought from social media, there is also an enormous dark underbelly. And some of the pervasive uh, efforts brought about by these companies and by uh, manipulators uh, from the outside to use this dark underbelly in, I think, destructive ways uh, were, were brought to the attention, I think, of, of America and, for that matter, the world. This challenge that we're talking about is not just an American problem. This is a worldwide problem dealing with worldwide companies. So I think it is important that Congress 
steps up and plays a role, and that we make sure that, at least in terms of what we can say, uh, what we have jurisdiction over is, as senators, that Americans and their private data is not misused or manipulated going forward. Um, now, let me be clear. Uh, one of the things that Senator Fisher and I talked a lot about as we went into, went into this process, we don't intend to regulate these platforms into oblivion. Um, matter of fact, I think we have taken a very light touch. I think even the enforcement mechanisms, which is actually, I know, received some criticism, um, but we've tried to recognize that we've got to maintain innovation, but we've got to put some guardrails in place. But as companies like Facebook and Google have gone, grown from kind of dorm room ideas into startups, into multi-billion dollar American companies, um, they've obviously acquired tremendous, tremendous power to reshape our world. And with that power comes great responsibility. Unfortunately, when it comes to protecting users and looking for out for their interests, the major platform companies are not doing enough even today in 2019. That's why last summer um, I started down this process when I put forward a white paper uh, that I hoped would spur conversations on tangible policy solutions surrounding social media. There were 20 plus ideas. I normally like to think of these in four buckets. Um, probably privacy, which has got some of the most advanced thinking, not only here on the Hill, but obviously uh, from the Europeans with GDPR and California, and now other states moving forward. Um, an area that we've not addressed yet, but I think uh, California's moved on, but I think we are gonna have to think through is questions around, and this one I've not taken a position on, identity validation, uh, or the, at least the notion that we ought to be able to know where they're being communicated with by a human being versus a bot, and easier said than done, as Tristan and others have explained. Third, I do think we're gonna have to have a conversation about content. Um, that is uh, uh, the notional idea of uh, in the late 90s that these companies were telephone operators in a sense as common carriers and had bore no responsibility at all versus today when 65% of Americans get their news from Facebook and Google. We at least ought to have that debate. And then finally, the fourth category of transparency and the Detour Act is one example of, of that kind of legislation. I introduced some additional legislation this week with Josh Hawley that talked about data transparency and data valuations. Uh, I'm working as well on data portability and interoperability, but there are a whole series of areas that I think um, um, we, we need to sort through. Let me be careful in a room like this full of experts. Uh, I don't want to nerd out, um, but I do think uh, it's important that we bear in mind what I believe is the, the driving notion, at least from my standpoint, behind the Detour Act. And that is that the idea that users should have the choice and autonomy when it comes to their personal data. When a company like Facebook asks you to upload your phone contacts or some other highly valuable data uh, to their platform, you ought to have a simple choice, yes or no, not yes or learn more. Um, we see this with privacy settings where agree is always the default option. Uh, and when, frankly, more privacy-friendly options, you have to go through a whole series of pages before you get that. Or I particularly like the effort where you've got 15 different arrows clicking on I agree, and somehow you can never find that unsubscribe button anywhere on that, that page. Uh, or, as already have been commented on, uh, when we see companies that run experiments on you without your consent to see which uh, um, options get you in hand over the most data. These dark patterns serve the companies and not the users. Uh, we ought to recognize that they are coercive and put, protect and, and put appropriate protections in place that defend users' ability to make informed choices. Design tricks like these may be clever, but in fact, they are part of a highly sophisticated toolkit that platforms use to gather more data and keep you on the site longer. The truth is, user data is among the most valuable assets these companies have. And as a result, they have a financial incentive to use and develop techniques that encourage and coerce users to hand over more and more of their data. Companies all also have an incentive to carry out 
the behavioral, behavioral, I can get that word out, I think, uh, messing with your behavior, experimentation, that informs dark patterns, and which is often conducted without consent. Again, it is now famous what happened in 2014 when Facebook conducted an experiment using nearly 70,000 users to study the emotional impact of manipulating information on their news feeds. Apparently, it never crossed anyone's mind at Facebook that maybe they should have informed participants first before they put them into that guinea pig type test. Um, well, I felt that was wrong back in 2014. It's why I contacted the FTC back then and said, uh, you needed to step up, they needed to step up their oversight of these type of experiments. Unfortunately, in the years since, we've seen that these ideas of user autonomy informed consent fall by the wayside, both for the companies, and there are exceptions, and I appreciate Zill and some of the others who've started to be willing to move into this space, um, but unfortunately, the major platform companies still have not done enough, and candidly, the regulators have been asleep at the switch. And that's why I believe that legislation like the Detour Act is so important. In addition to prohibiting large online platforms from using dark patterns to trick consumers into handing over their personal data, the bill would also require informed consent for this kind of behavior experimentation. And in the process, we will be sending a clear message to the platform companies and the FTC that they are now in the business of preserving users' autonomy when it comes to the use of their personal data. Our goal is simple, to bring some transparency to what remains a very opaque market and give consumers the tools they need to make informed choices about how and when to share their personal information. Dark patterns are deployed for an array of opaque reasons the average user will never recognize. This is why this bill and this type of regu regu um, regulation I believe are absolutely necessary. The only way forward to ensure that these digital companies are actually serving their users' best interests. Um, the truth is, dark patterns have to go. I think this legislation will take uh, uh, that direction. I'm very proud of the fact that it's bipartisan, and uh, I didn't stress some of the comments of the last pattern or the last uh, panel that I thought were very important. That the notion that a consumer that is already overwhelmed on their website is going to sort through uh, and outthink some of the techniques that these platform companies have literally spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars developing to be as opaque and as tricky as possible is an unrealistic expectation on, put on consumers. So I think this legislation that we've put forward is a step in the right direction. I think we've done it in a way that takes a light touch approach uh, one that I know, again, has some pushback in this room, but we're willing to continue to discuss. And I candidly think if we don't act, um, the consumers' revolt against these um, platform companies will even grow stronger. So uh, I hope that this legislation will move forward, and I now want to bring forward to the podium my partner on this, someone who I think has got personal experiences in, in uh, why this kind of legislation is needed, and that's Senator Deb Fisher from Nebraska. Deb, thank you. <clears throat> Well, good afternoon, everyone, and I appreciate you being here and having an interest in our bill. As Senator Warner said, uh, this is a bipartisan bill. It, um, I think it's a big deal. A lot, of, uh, a lot of folks are saying, well, this is just a small part. It's a first step. I think it's uh, pretty amazing that we are, that we are taking this on and uh, seeing the tremendous support not just here in the Senate, um, but a, with stakeholders as well. As we know, I'm following notes as well because I want to stay on track. Um, you know, as you can tell, senators can get off and, and uh, chat about it. But I would like to point out, before my staff says get back on your notes, uh, that we had a great hearing this morning in the Commerce Committee and uh, heard a lot of amazing things. I think this is so important to be able to educate the public on what's going on. I had a, one of my good friends who was so mad uh, at her gadget one day because she couldn't 
figure out how was she was going to get out of this thing where you had to click OK and she didn't want to click OK. And I said, well, I found I just have to turn off my computer. It's the only way I can get out of it. I, I don't want to give them any information. And she said, what do you mean, give them information? And I said, do you know about dark patterns? Because as soon as you click on this, you're giving away all sorts of knowledge about yourself. You're giving up your privacy. And what we heard this morning uh, from Tristan was pretty frightening on uh, what, what these companies can figure out about you by a si simple little click on OK. We know that technology is driving innovations, and that's exciting. And it's, it's engaging. It's innovative. We want that to continue. But I think today is also a very important opportunity to discuss when that incentive is going to be positive and when it's not. So we can get that information out there when that engagement goes a step too far. Tech companies are increasingly being able to tailor your online experience in ways that are more granular. Now, on one hand, you get a more personalized user experience, and platforms are more responsive because they know what makes you tick. However, it's this variability that allows companies to take that design just a step too far. Companies are constantly competing for users' attention, and this increases the motivation for, I think, more intrusive, more invasive user design. All too quickly, businesses, they can cross that line where it comes to triggering the privacy and ethical concerns. The ability for online platforms to guide the visual interfaces that billions of people view is an incredible influence. It, fo it forces us to assess the impact of design on user privacy and well-being. Fundamentally, the Detour Act, this bill, would prohibit large online platforms from purposely using deceptive user interfaces, which you know are dark patterns. Although the term was mostly unheard of a few years ago, or a few weeks ago, or maybe even a few hours ago, many of us can recognize that dark patterns that we've personally experienced. When a website or an app prompts you for input, and there's no way to navigate around that screen interruption, you're trapped, and you're trapped in that maze, and you can't get out. So users can just click OK to get to the next screen. But this can hide what the action really does. It shares your contacts, your locations, and even your messages. And then users searching for the privacy-friendly option they regularly must click through a longer process. So the options on the screen can be worded in biased ways, while important information is left out or totally diminished. You'll be prompted simply to consent now, consent later, or as the senator said, learn more. We should always want to learn more, but in this case, no. So while the opt-out button is displayed sometimes in a small gray text that you can't even see. Often the scope of how the platform uses the data is not clear. That button that you just clicked on, that consented to face recognition for security purposes, could be used for targeting advertising based on emotional states. So do we all need to cover up the camera that's looking at us? when we're on our computers. Don't worry, though, because companies will just tell you to delete your account or un uninstall your app for the less intrusive choice. Looking to the EU, we see that a core part of the GDPR is to protect consumer data by requiring freely given specific and informed consent. However, the Europeans are already noticing user design work around that we can inform consent by purposely confusing the choices. They see settings with a 
a toggle that is preset shared data with third parties. You just have to click the big accept and continue button. And loss of function can be threatened falsely if you don't. Others may see thousands of pre-checked boxes set to share your data, making it impossible for the user to uncheck them all. Unbiased and clear user interface design is vital to achieving any type of informed consent. It's a simple trick to list several empty choices that don't actually empower users to control how their data, data is going to be collected or how they interact with that platform. Despite appearances of clever web designs, there is not truly a choice here. The Detour Act would provide a better accountability system for imp improved transparency and autonomy online. Our legislation would take an important step to restore the hidden options. It would give users a tool to get out of the maze that coaxes you to just click on that I agree. Tech companies that assert that our users have choice and control they're just beating on a hollow publicity campaign. Some companies are now allowing users to make online behavior private from other users. Well, that can be helpful, but it is not enough. Consumers' core interaction with the online platform itself isn't something that will change without meaningful bipartisan policy policy efforts. A privacy framework that involves consent cannot function properly if it doesn't ensure the user interface presents fair and transparent options. The Detour Act would enable the creation of a professional standards body which can register with the Federal Trade Commission. And this would serve as a self-regulatory body to develop best practices for UI design with the FTC as a backup. The bill would also ban design features aimed at generating compulsive uses by children. Children are especially vulnerable to persuasive techniques online. If Congress is to approach the data privacy and digital rights in any sort of comprehensive manner, we need to take a hard look at design. Under current law, dark patterns can be more readily identified as harmful practices in the e-commerce space. At times, it's easier to recognize a harm when the company sneakily adds a product automatically to your online shopping basket. However, we need clarity for the enforcement of dark patterns that don't directly involve our wallets. We need policies that place value on user choice and personal data online. We need a stronger mechanism to protect the public interest when the goal for tech companies is to make people engage more and more and more. User consent remains weakened by the presence of dark patterns and unethical design. Curbing the use of dark patterns will be foundational to increasing trust online. Now, we know that no legislation is a silver bullet, but the Detour Act does provide a key, key, key step in getting there. I'd like to thank you again for being here. I'd like to thank Senator Warner and his staff in moving forward on what we believe is a very forward-looking, positive piece of legislation that will help consumers. Thank you. Everyone. Um, thank you, Senator Warner and Senator Fisher, for uh, for having me here. Um, I think I'm going to go for about 20 minutes, and then any questions afterwards, or that's okay. Maybe some couple questions afterwards. Um, so, 
what, what I'd like to talk to you about is I think why the Detour Act is such a key step in, in the right direction and why I think people underestimate persuasive technology. So, you know, when I was a kid, if you don't know my background, by the way, I was a design ethicist at Google. I was studying uh, the ethics of how do you steer two billion people's thoughts when you shape the way that screens work, news feeds work, notifications work, things like that. And uh, the reason I, was, I had studied that is because in college I was at a lab called the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. I actually studied with the founders of Instagram, who were my project partners. Originally, the idea back then was we could use persuasion for good. Uh, in fact, we were actually interested in uh, depression. And we actually built an app together, the founders of Instagram and I, uh, called Send the Sunshine. And the way it worked was if you knew that someone was in another zip code, your friend, and they had uh, seven days of bad weather, because of seasonal affective depression disorder, the idea was what if the app texted you telling you to take a picture of the sunshine and send it to your friend? And so before we get into the, the ethics of this, I mean, I, I want to name that there is an intention that you can use persuasion for positive things. And this lab, BJ Fogg, uh, the professor, uh, taught students about, well, how, how would we think about persuading people's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors in a positive way? And was concerned, actually, in 1996 about, I did a presentation to the FTC on the ethics of persuasive technology. And unfortunately, I think the world that we now live in today has been terraformed by a persuasive technology and replaced an abstract substrate with a new persuasive environment that has actually dominated the sense-making and choice-making of our lives. And I think the way to first see this is through um, the, the lens of power. So w whether we're in a symmetrical or equal relationship with technology when we use it, or are we in an asymmetric relationship? And I think the way, the best metaphor for this is, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was a magician, and magic is all about giving you the impression that you, the subject, are in a symmetrical relationship with me. I'm, in an, I'm just an equal. I say, pick a card, any card, in that moment, it feels as if we're just neutrals. You know, I'm just right here with you. And in fact, there's an invisible asymmetry of power. I actually know a lot more about how your mind works and what's going to happen next than you know what's coming. And the, I think the thing we can see that's going on with technology is an increase in the trend of that asymmetry. So if you measured, took a protractor out and said, what's the level of asymmetry between a magician and getting you to pick a card? You can measure that out. And then you could say, in the attention economy, that increase is growing. And that's where our problems are coming from. So as everyone's already talked about, uh, because we live in an attention economy, because it's a finite research uh, resource of attention, takes nine months to grow a new human being and plug them into the attention economy, uh, we have to, it's a zero-sum race. So we have to get more and more aggressive or invasive, in Senator Fisher's words, about getting that attention. And so first, we persuade your behavior. You know, we add the pull to refresh uh, slot machine mechanic. Uh, we add the countdown autoplay on YouTube that's removing the stopping cue. It's just like casino design where you don't want any right angles in a casino because right angles are an opportunity for your mind to wake up and make a choice about whether I, I want to still do what I'm doing. Instead, you want to remove stopping cues. You want to remove right angles. You want to keep the flow just going. But this is not the kind of psychological flow that... Um, is famous for being positive. It's this kind of designed psychological flow to achieve the goals of the persuader. So first we hack your behavior, but then the race for attention gets more aggressive. So we have to hack your habits. We have to go deeper down the brainstem and hack your neurophysiological system, get you to do something three or four times once you get to repeat yourself. Now you have that inbuilt habit where after watching, clicking on that web website or checking that one app, now I automatically have you ingrained checking the next app that you always check after the first one because I've bound those two things together in your brain. So I've hijacked that part. And that's not enough. We have to find even deeper ways to hijack people. So uh, we crawl deeper down the brainstem into social validation and approval. So instead of getting your attention, that takes a lot of money and engineers time and effort to get your attention. It's much cheaper to get you addicted to getting attention from other people. So uh, that's where you get likes and followers. Because once I show you that you can follow someone else and you have a number of people who are following you, now you get excited because you've got this audience of people who are, so now you care about how many likes you get and you care about how many people are looking at your stuff and whether or not you get YouTube influencer culture, you get Instagram narcissism, you get uh, the entire thing because we've basically hooked people to getting attention from other people. You get Twitch gaming, by the way, you know, people who make money by playing games and we're all addicted now to getting attention. We didn't wake up 20 years ago saying, you know, we have this huge problem that we're, none of us are getting attention. We've actually created this world by accident because of this race for attention. 
And then the thing that's happening next is that the race for attention migrates to, again, measuring out these asymmetries of power each time it's getting bigger. Social validation and approval is, is a really big gap between the child and the teenager and their social validation. That's led to an increase, by the way, of in the last, after two decades in decline, high depressive, high depressive symptoms for teen girls between 10 to 14 years old has gone up 170%. Uh, teen suicides are up uh, for that age bracket. And a lot of it does have to do with social media. What do you think is going to happen when you dose um, millions of te teenagers with photo after photo after photo of your friends having fun without you? Or in the case of beautification filters, uh, a persuasive technique that basically alters your self-image, uh, anchors your validation to an unrealistic version of yourself. So uh, people, you're essentially taught at your nervous system level, people only like you when you look different than you actually do. Um, so, I'm sorry, I just want to give you a tour of, of how we got here, because I think it's very easy to sort of say this is all just kind of by accident, or this is what people want, but there's actually a kind of design. It's not an accident. And in the race for attention, again, it goes deeper into um, a race to compete on prediction. Who can better predict how to get you to do something? And so imagine, you know, uh, on, over here you have um, Facebook, and so you're about to do this and flick your finger up to figure out what's going to come next. And then on my other side, you have a YouTube autoplay countdown, five, four, three, two, one. And so when both of those things happen, flick and countdown, you get two supercomputers that are activating to figure out what's the best thing I can predict can I put in front of your eyeballs next that's going to keep you there. And at that moment it does that, it wakes up an avatar voodoo doll-like version of you. Right? And the voodoo doll is based on all the click patterns you've ever given it all the likes you've ever had, and it makes the voodoo doll look and act increasingly like you. And so the more data that's collected, that has your friends, it has other, it can make the voodoo doll just increasingly stimulatedly act just like you. And then it split tests, if I were to show you this video, or this newsfeed item, or this thing, what would happen? And it's predicting and making predictions and running so many simulations that it's, it's so asymmetrically powerful, that's what I want you to get, that the asymmetry of persuasive technology started small and it's getting bigger and bigger, because it's like playing chess against Garry Kasparov, right? So if you and I play chess against the best human chess player in the world, why, why do we lose? Because Garry's just seeing, you know, you're, you're plotting ahead a couple moves. If I do this, he'll do this. And then when he's playing chess against you, he's just playing out more moves. So he's going to win. But when he plays chess against the computer, and the computer can out-simulate way more moves ahead than even Garry, the best human chess player we had, that's not just checkmate against Gary, that's checkmate against the limits of the human mind, right? Because that, that was the best human chess player, so we can't have a human brain simulate more things ahead. So in a world where you have this level of asymmetric power that's been masked as we're just giving people what they want, that's like a magician saying, well, you picked that card, I didn't influence your choice in any way, that's the invisible asymmetry. And we have a name for asymmetric power. Um, it's fiduciary law or duty of care, right? It's, we, it's like a doctor or a priest who has compromising information about you, but because they have that level of asymmetry, you would never allow a priest to have the business model of selling access to the confession booth to manipulate you to someone else, right? And so I think what's gone on here is that the tech platform started off in this, in this actual equal relationship, which is that you know, at the beginning, they were just offering a search box, and they were just offering a cool website to connect with your friends and people thought it was cool. But where we've gotten is a world where that asymmetry has grown and the companies are now competing, not on manipulating your immediate behavior, but manipulating and predicting the future. And the example of this is Facebook has something called loyalty prediction, which allows them to sell to an advertiser the ability to predict when you're gonna become disloyal to a brand. So like, let's say you're a mother and you're about to you use Pampers, but you're about to switch to a different diaper brand. Facebook can predict that that's about to happen and then it can sell that opportunity to another advertiser before you know maybe you're going to switch. So the problem here is you cannot have asymmetric power that is, that is self-dealing or extractive. You can't. You can't have a doctor whose business model is maximizing their own well-being or their own profit without caring about your, you know, your well-being. You can't have a, a therapist who's doing that. You can't have a priest who's doing that. And so I, I see that the Detour Act is a huge step in the right direction because it's about really calling attention to this asymmetry and preventing deceptive asymmetry. Um, and you know, I think that, that where this is going 
is we're going to be able to predict increasing things about people without even collecting their data. So speaking as a former computer scientist, um, you know, if Cambridge Analytica was bad uh, because we could take your Facebook likes and we could predict your political personality and we could run, we have some experts in the audience about this, and we could run ads that were directly tuned to your uh, political personality, there's a paper out by Gloria Mark at UC Irvine that without collecting any of your likes, I can just look at the way that you click around a computer screen, just the way, the temporality between how you click, and I can re-predict the same big five personality traits just by looking at how you click. So it's like the end of the poker face. Your, your behavior, your, the way that you walk is your, your kind of, your signature. And that's the world we're headed into. You know, IBM can predict with 95% accuracy uh, that when you're about to quit your job. Right. Um, computers can predict um, when you, you, that you might be gay before you know that you're gay. They can predict that you're pregnant. Right? And so increasingly, as we can predict these things about you, data is the fuel that creates these predictions. So we need a new relationship for this asymmetric power. And there really is just one way to do it. We need to have a duty of care, um, which, and we cannot have an advertising business model, which is to say free is the most expensive business model we've ever created. Um, and the good news is that this is a, a transition that is possible to make. I mean, it is totally possible to make a different kind of technology that is humane, regenerative, uh, that does not have this business model, but it requires treating asymmetrically powerful technologies to be in service of the systems that they, that they, that they are supposed to protect. So, for example, I think a way to think about what's happening overall is Mark Andreessen, the founder of Netscape's insight that software is eating the world. And when, when he said this in 2011, he was meaning that if you take any part of society, whether it's taxis or railroads or media advertising, the one that's run by humans versus the one that's run by computers, the computers can just do it more efficiently. So we're always going to have computers start to run more and more parts of our society. But when software gobbles up a part of our public sphere, or when it gobbles up Saturday morning cartoons, which we used to have protections around Saturday morning cartoons, um, we lost the protections that we used to have there. So YouTube for kids or just YouTube gobbles up Saturday morning, and it's starting to steer people towards this more extreme radicalizing stuff that we talked about in the hearing this morning. They're not putting the same protections that, uh, that, we, that we need. And so you know, when, when Facebook and Google um, and Twitter gobble up the public information environment um, or the global information warfare environment, we replace NATO and the Department of Defense with... 20 engineers between Facebook, Google, and Twitter. And so it's not, we're gobbling up increasing parts of our society without protecting them. And so the reason I'm so excited about this bill and the work in general that, um, that Senator Warner has been doing uh, since we started these conversations two years ago is we actually have to take responsibility. When you have asymmetric power, you need to have take responsibility. And I think that's the, hopefully the, the change that we're, we're starting today. So thank you guys all for listening. Do you want to do any questions? I think we'll open up the Q&A. I think we have uh, at least three of our panelists who are interested in this. Uh, and then uh, two weeks from here, we actually have four of our speakers back. So if, if the panelists can stay here, I assume we'll be doing two weeks over the next several months. Uh, Marsha Paul, Armin, can you please stay on the stage? Yeah. <laughs> and we had a question that was being answered for the Internet and Housing Act. Like I said, everyone loves this bill. Can I ask a question? <laughs> so can you, um, some of the examples we were talking about earlier were dark patterns in sort of a shopping flow, like an onboarding flow or a consent flow. And some of your examples are actually sort of addictive patterns that aren't based on the user onboarding flow. And I'm wondering how you distinguish those and whether you need a different regulatory framework for one than the other. Because the, the addictive patterns strike me as harder to define a regulatory approach around, but I don't I just Yeah, I mean, it is, it is very hard to define. Um, I, I think of this more in the realm of standards and practices. You know, in public communication, there are standards and practices for a broadcaster they have to uphold. So I can see a world where onboarding flows have that kind of um, model. I think with addiction, what's really tricky, uh, and this happened with cigarettes and, and sugar, is that people actually self-report liking the whole, the whole thing, right? And so, um, 
if you say, let's take away you know, the follow button, like the, the follow button with Instagram, which generated the social comparison and generated the addiction to attention, it's much harder to say what we would do instead. So I, I think these are the questions that I want everyone to be asking so that everyone, you know, we can't, you know, a small handful of us can't figure this out, but I think with researchers, with designers, that these are the kind of questions we have to ask is, what is a high agency choice making environment on, on technology? And um, yeah. I mean, since there is a stream, let me keep playing moderator and just repeat your question, partly because that was the question I was going to ask if no one raised their hands. So um, in, in the panel, I teed up this 100 million user mark, and you just repeated how that is a, is a line you can draw, but it's not going to touch the vast majority of actors and probably the vast majority of dark patterns. So what is it about the largest online providers that make us want to focus on them first or only? Um, is it that because of their scale, they have more powerful dark patterns? Is it because if we're doing a moral accounting for harm, they're just harming more people? Or is it politics? You've got to draw a line somewhere. Let's start here. And what do we do about the smaller entities that cause dark patterns? I'm looking at Tristan, partly because I, I'm curious to see what you say, but I think anyone could jump on that. So. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I can't speak for the people who actually brought the the, uh, the Detour Act about, but um, uh, I, I think the intention, at least, it seems like, was uh, this is a conversation starter for some of the bigger companies who have more reach and scale of uh, users that they really touch. But at least in our research, we've also seen that many of the deceptive practices, like you uh, mentioned, are from smaller firms and companies. Um, and, and the larger companies really don't do that because uh, they have uh, perhaps greater risk in terms of uh, you know, getting caught and perhaps the, the PR backlash that will ensue. Um, but uh, they, they do engage in manipulative practices, that, and, and I think that definitely warrants a lot of attention, which, we, which this bill definitely gets at, but you're totally right in that, uh, that they shouldn't be the sole uh, 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 companies that are targeted. Uh, perhaps there is a, a need here to target more broadly. Uh, but maybe this is a starting point. Yeah, I think another good point is this is just one part of what could be a more comprehensive privacy uh, enforcement environment that we have here in the U.S., right? This is just one subset. And I think also hitting companies that have a large number of users is also great for consumer engagement, right? Like They may not have any kind of awareness of this other website that does do some pretty deceptive, dark things, but they are aware that they can never find their settings on Facebook, so if we can help work on, I think, what consumers are worried about, we can just build on this as part one of a more uh, comprehensive data privacy regulation regime. I think the question you're, I didn't mean to jump in, but I think the question you're asking, I was asked yesterday actually, given everything that's happened, would you trust if Facebook suddenly magically did reclass itself and its advertising business model changed its subscription 
and they were reclassed under fiduciary, some kind of new fiduciary, um, would you trust them? Would you trust the leadership? Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> I think that in terms of, uh, I don't say this with a, an axe to grind, by the way. I just think everyone would agree with that. I don't think that the leadership that's in charge now can be trusted, and especially the organizational cultures that have been building. If you just think of this from an organizational theory perspective, when you have people whose blind spots were structural to enable the situation that we're in in the first place, creating a whole culture that defends and protects the existing status quo, which we know is pernicious and harmful to democracy, then that culture itself can't be trusted. So um, I know that there's change efforts going on inside of Google, uh, Facebook right now, and I think that it's getting gridlocked in a way because even people who are good-hearted who want to see these changed, uh, you still have bonus structures and employee culture that has actually been baked with, with this for a long time. So I, one positive step, though, as an example, is that Facebook has started incentivizing positive social impact with employee bonuses. So there's, those are steps in the right direction. And those kinds of standards and practices and what would companies do to prove that their incentives and their you know, behavior are actually aligned with the well-being of society would be good questions we'd want to ask. And uh, it also relates to the size question because not everybody can do that. Like what, what's missing in the education process in that lab? You know, it's, it's tricky just speaking to the experience of the Persuasive Tech Lab and the people who were there. I mean, there's a variety of different places people went. Some people went off into, you know, really dark advertising market, you know, systems. They went into the business of viral video advertising on YouTube, just the dark, dark, dark stuff. And that's where they went. They probably worked at places like Cambridge Analytica. Um, and then there's other people who didn't use it at all, and there's other people like the Instagram guys who were just trying to make something that they thought would be really fun. I mean, I don't think when I described it the way I did, that there is a deliberate intention to be, um, uh, you know, to, to race down the brainstem and get into people's social validation. That was an unintentional consequence that you're A-B testing your way to what works, and the problem is what works is not what's good for people. And um, when I think, though, about what kind of education is necessary, I think we have to move away from just abstract ethical reasoning to very specific surgical belief re updates inside of the engineering mind. So the key one is we're just giving people what they want. If we can't have a, a moral foundation to stand on that says, well, why is it that we're not just giving people what they want when they keep getting reinforced in a reinforcement loop on YouTube deeper down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and all right, like crazy nationalism stuff. Um, if we just say that we're giving people what they want or this is just human nature, we're just a mirror these are inadequate frames to describe what is actually happening in that asymmetry of power. And I'd say there's probably only a list of, like, I don't have them off the top of my head, but about 10 major false beliefs or inadequate beliefs that most engineers have. And if you actually, I've talked to some people who are in the industry about this recently, and, and they're, they're actually in charge of doing ethics education. And it's less about, like, let's teach people this entire rich, you know, more, you know, Kant and Jeremy Bentham. And it's not about that. It's there's these specific like mistaken beliefs and excuses. And if you can update those, you can create a richer conversation. So I think that's where I get hope. Well, and I'll, I mean, I'm a lawyer, so this is my hammer, but having laws that kind of provide a superstructure of shortcuts of kind of, you know, boiling down ethical frameworks into a clear prohibition reinforces the kind of education, yeah. right? And so I don't think we should make everything that's unethical illegal, but I think a well-tailored law that says, hey, by the way, pay attention to this part of the ethics training that we're forcing you to do you will be in trouble and we will pay fines if you violate this. That's a, that's a useful hook uh, for, for both driving the conversation and for getting their attention, 
assuming, of course, that the law is sensible and well-crafted, which isn't always the case. But that's why I'm excited about something like the Detour Act, because then on day three of your training in Google, they'll say, by the way, pay attention to this. Don't do sleazy no buttons, because if you do, you're going to get us hauled into the FTC. I think that's going to go a long way to kind of inculcating the kind of ethical behavior we want, if not the ethical humans we want at companies like that. So. And this question wasn't directed at me, but having more diverse viewpoints in the room when you're talking about these sort of technologies would be helpful. A lot of these dark patterns we're mentioning here today may seem dark and deceptive to the average user, but someone with different visual impairments may not even see some of these options on their screen. Yeah, I can see that. I see one more hand back there. You're talking about a law like the Detour Act? So I think the question is, assume this passes, assume companies start to implement what it requires, how will the consumer experience change? I mean, this goes a little to your study, right? Um, a lot of those behaviors are, are visible to users. If we w waved a magic senatorial wand and made them go away, would users notice? I think to, to the extent that the interfaces are actually visible in the first place, they will. They're not all. Some are hidden. Some but, are hidden. Yeah. Right. And the influence that they have on users uh, is, is really not visible to them. Uh, so I think uh, th those are important to also talk about. And a law like this will really uh, maybe prevent them or limit them. But um, there might be some changes that they might not users might not even notice in the, to begin with. I mean, I have a, another way of getting at that question, which is, you know, we've had this silly debate for 20 years now about contracts in terms of service and user choice and opt-out versus opt-in. And dark patterns are such an important part to bring to that conversation because it turns out that's been smoke and mirrors. We haven't really ever given the consumer the opportunity to truly understand the deal that's being offered to them. And so if we could ma wave this magic wand and it really just cleaned up the way that communication happens online, I think we'd reboot that conversation. I think in a funny way, companies would finally, for the first time, be able to say, look, we clean up everything, and still they're following us down the primrose path or whatever analogy you want to use. Um, and so it might bring back what feels a little passe, which are debates about notice and choice and contracts and you know clear communication, which is great. It's another reason why I'm excited by this. I also think that uh, consumers would face a lot less frustration on the platforms that they use to opt out or to unsubscribe or to... Uh, say no to a default would be a much simpler process and wouldn't feel as hair pulling it is as it is now. Uh, I think that would change. I also think that it would just be great for users to have the idea that they could say no instead of having to push the learn more button and then 12 more buttons and then finally say no. I think the point you brought up earlier about um, how much energy it takes and just drains in people. I mean, I was giving the example in the Senate hearing this morning. Um, have you ever tried to cancel your Facebook account? actually go to the screen. So if you hit delete, um, what does it do? It doesn't delete it. And what does it show you? It shows you a list of here's all the friends that will miss you. And it actually puts up the faces of those friends. And it puts up, you know, if I were Facebook, you'd put up all the content you're going to lose, all the photos you've ever been tagged in you, all the special memories, like the special, special ones that we know that you keep going back to. And then we put up the photos of the friends that were calculate. Like we'll actually use a supercomputer to calculate which photos would most cause you to hit cancel on this dialogue. And you can bet for sure that there's a lot of energy and work that went into making that dialogue hit back into cancel. So, I mean, in this world, it, the point is we'd be a fiduciary more to your agency, and we'd actually be not putting up 100 different barriers where we actually have to exert a lot of our own conscious energy, which is the most finite resource on the planet right now. Our attention is the, the, the last thing we've got, and it's being just totally chipped away. So I think, I think of this overall as a transition um, from an extractive economy that you know, built up just like our energy economy, extractive energy buoyed up this entire period of economic prosperity, and thank you, and now we need to switch to a regenerative energy economy, otherwise we're dead. So it's, it's the same thing with attention. We, we've been extracting attention, extracting behavior, extracting, you know, extorting manipulation, and we need to move to a regenerative um, attention economy that actually treats attention as sacred, and we're not, trying to, we're not directly tying profit to how much extraction we get out of your brain. Rafi, you want us to... Uh,